Hi guys, welcome to the archive. This week I'm going to show you how you can pull together some of those modular pieces that I've shown in other builds to make a large build like this with absolutely minimal effort. All I really needed to make this build this week was some door frames and some accessories. Practically everything else was already built and I could take it apart from this build that I made this week and turn it into an equally large build next week with a completely different theme, completely different accessories, but minimal effort still. If you haven't seen any of the videos from my modular terrain series yet, where most of this stuff comes from, the link will be in the description and it will probably be there somewhere, hopefully. So if you like what you see, go check it out at the end of the video. There's also a full time lapse and description of every piece that I've used to make this build at the end of the video, so you can easily see what I've done and basically how to replicate it. This build was actually voted for by my patrons and I've actually ended up doing it a little bit earlier than I would have otherwise planned because of that. They get to choose which video comes up next. If you'd like that kind of influence over what comes next on the channel versus what gets delayed, the Patreon tier links are in the description. So if you'd like to support the channel and get a little bit of influence over that, check them out. So step one to making this piece was adding some long overdue additions to the modular tiles in the form of wooden door frames, interior walls and interior door frames. For this build I only needed one of each, but I can easily bang out more of those to fill out the interior design of wood structures or wood upper floors that I make in future. The door frame is probably the most important, not least because I've been promising it since the stable video where I first showed off all of these wood modular pieces. To get started with it, I cut a 2 inch by 3 inch, 1 quarter inch thick piece of XPS foam exactly as I did for the wooden walls in the stable video. I made sure the grain was cut to allow for easy texturing running down the wall, exactly as I did in that project. If you're not sure what I mean by this, I went through it in detail in that stable video. Basically I found you can control the direction of the grain by cutting in a certain direction with your hot wire. Instead of getting straight to work on texturing, I measured a half inch from the bottom and used the wall door template from the magnetic building tiles video to draw out the same shape that I used for the stone doors. This will basically allow me to use the same doors for both stone and wood, which means I only need to make them once. Also means any special doors that I make in future, like prison doors or reinforced doors, I can use on either door frame. I cut this out right down to the bottom, including the bottom half inch. I was going to add this back in later with a different piece, mainly so I could have the grain running across rather than down. It's a good idea to cut it out slightly wider than the template to give the door room to move. From there I measured a quarter inch out from each side and drew in straight lines with a knife, which I then indented slightly with a sculpting tool and the lid of my pen. Before I went any further, I needed to cut in the quarter inch vertical planks into the wall. Cut them, bevel them and wire brush them exactly like I did for the walls in the stable video. I didn't do this for the indented bits because it wasn't really necessary, they're going to be hidden anyway. Now was a good time to add that block back in at the bottom, which I did with a three quarter of an inch by half an inch by one quarter of an inch piece of foam cut with a grain running along the length so I could have it horizontal when I wire brushed it and hot glued it in. To make the piece look like a proper door frame and less like a wall with a piece cut out, I added in some quarter inch by one eighth of an inch strips, one and a quarter inch long, wire brushed and exactly the same as I used on the walls, to line the outer edge of the rectangle that I'd squashed in. The idea here was to make it look like these pieces were part of the structure rather than just being nailed on the outside. I cut out both these and the next piece to make sure they all fit before gluing them together. The top piece needed to have a curve cut out of the centre in order to fit the door. I did this by holding up to the door frame and cutting a rough line into it using the frame as a template. Then you just need to add more quarter inch strips to the bottom and middle exactly as I showed for walls in the stable video so they line up with, you know, the walls. The middle strips I cut to 7 eighths of an inch long to fit flush against the door frame and the edge. Once I had them all cut I glued them in place, trimming any as needed to get that flush fit. And that's enough of a door frame to push some holes into, exactly as I showed in the magnetic building tiles video for stone doors, and voila, doors from that video should fit in this one too. 
Finally, I cut the card tab connection system and fitted the magnets and accessory slots. Again, exactly as I showed in the original magnetic building system video. Basically, I cut a chunk out of the bottom and add chipboard to hold a chipboard tab. I add magnets in all four sides to connect to the other walls and I poke in some accessory slots for the wall clip on accessories. I go into more detail in those other videos and you'll probably be watching them anyway if you're building this door. The wood in a wall I showed off the rough design for in the magnetic building tiles video and is so simple I'll just show here and quickly explain how it works while playing with it and some tiles. I cut one quarter inch planks into one and a half inch by three inch piece of three sixteenth of an inch thick foam. Bit of a mouthful that. I then cut a slit into the bottom using my hot wire which I used to attach serial card tabs to. And then added quarter inch planks much like all of the other walls before cutting the ends at a 45 degree angle so they can all line up when corner to corner. You can also add accessory slots much like the normal wood walls. If you'd like to see how the interior wall system works with more tips on how to use it, check out the magnetic building system video, that's where I originally created and showed how to use this system. The inner door frame is made in exactly the same way as the outer door frame, but without the bottom half inch, using 3 16th of an inch thick foam like the inner walls, and with a strip of lollipop stick, coffee stirrer, that kind of thing, along the top to toughen it up. The bottom of the door instead slots into the wood slits in the floor. The one downside of this is that these are tighter than the corners of the stone tiles, so unlike the stone interior doors, the door can't easily be pushed open. You can make it work by making the gaps wider, but then it starts to look a bit weird, like the floorboards have huge gaps. I kind of decided against it. I might try and come up with a way to make this work in future, but for now this is a decent compromise. Alternatively, you can just not use doors in the wooden interiors, or you can pluck them out, open the door, pluck them back in again, which is perfectly easy to do. I painted all of them to match the rest of my wood tiles, again exactly as I showed in the stable video, with a Mod Podge and dark brown base coat, and a dark brown and tan mix dry brushed over the top. And that's pretty much all we need to make the structure of the main building when combined with tiles from the stable video and the modular roof video. I used 8 wood floors and built the walls too high. It's also important to remember that you don't need to make the full building if you don't want to. You can make enough pieces to show a facade on one side and then rotate it once the players venture inside. If you're enjoying the video, don't forget to take a second to like, subscribe and hit that bell if you want to make sure you see future videos that I put out. Anyway, back to the point. Using the modular pieces that I've made before has freed up a ton of time in this project, which I use to work on useful scatter terrain pieces like crates, barrels, fishing nets, piles of rope and rusty chains, but with a twist. The problem I've always had with this kind of scatter terrain is I really like the freedom of being able to place pieces individually, but sometimes I just want to throw down a stack of crates or barrels and be done with it. Enter the magnetic pallet framework. These are literally just 2 inches square of 1 32nd of an inch thick balsa wood which I wire brushed and super glued to tin cut from a tin can lid. I used craft sticks layered underneath to keep things nice and flat by virtue of them being stubborn, unbendable buggers. The tin I cut down to the same size and blunted the edges using a metal nail file. It's best to wear a pair of protective gloves while doing this. I used woodworking gloves but you could probably use gardening gloves for much the same effect. If you wanted to make double sure the tin was touch safe, you could cover the edges with putty or hot glue. It's hidden underneath anyway. They're magnetic, cheap, easy to make and let you slap magnets in the bottom of barrels, crates and so on to mix and match and slap down quickly while keeping that freedom to put things where you want. The bonus being it's a lot harder to knock them around because, well, magnets. The way I see it, anywhere there's a pile of crates, it wouldn't be too unusual to see a wooden pallet underneath them, if only to keep them off potentially soggy ground and going horribly rotten. But anyway, neat trick aside, the crates have some other cool features. Firstly, I made a few different sizes to add some variety. These are mostly made from 1 16th of an inch thick balsa, cut from these ever useful 2 and 3 inch wide 1 16th of an inch thick strips, and I just tacky glued them together. I made some 1 inch crates and some 3 quarters of an inch. The measurement for each I've put on screen now to make it easier for you guys to cut and stick your own at this scale if you wanted to. 
For each side I used a pencil to bevel in some equal spaced planks, and added nail holes using a cocktail stick tip. I realised later it would be easier to add these nail holes later, after the base coat of paint, and fill them in with a little bit of black paint, which avoids them being filled back in by the base coat. Just after the base coat is also a good time to go back over the beveling if you needed to. I glued tin beneath the lids and left them unattached and added some thin strips of balsa underneath so it could slot back on nicely without sliding around. This not only allows me to stack crates on top of each other easily, it also lets me put accessories from my furniture systems on top to add even more variety and flavour. Both types of crate have magnets in the bottom, which I put in by drilling a 3mm hole carefully into the balsa and super gluing a magnet in. I made sure the magnets were all facing the same way around as the magnets in the bottom of all my other accessories, like tables, bars, bottles, candles, etc. I always try to keep the same side pointing up in everything, which tends to keep everything nice and easy for compatibility. If you haven't seen this stuff before and you like the look of it, take a look at my magnetic table video. There's quite a few accessories in there that are pretty cool. Having the lid be detachable also allows me to stuff them with fake hay, which I cut from leftover jute twine threads from when I made my thatch roof in the stable video. It's also pretty easy just to strip out of jute twine, it's not hard to do. This potentially allows you to hide things for players to find inside. Final useful little thing, if you don't fill them with straw, you can store the small ones inside the big ones like Russian dolls. Eh, every little helps. Or, you can glue the lid on to make them even easier to stack and fling around. Kinda depends how flexible you want to be versus ease of use. For the barrels, I cheated. I'm gonna be honest, I don't like any of the barrel crafting methods that I've seen, and though I did come up with a way to make them from balsa wood and actually still make it curved, which was pretty cool, it took forever and I, it, honestly it just wasn't worth it. So instead I bought some nice resin ones and drilled magnet holes in the bottom of each one. I put four magnets in the bottom of the larger barrels to give them more stability. You could get away with less than this, I just wanted to make sure that these heavier pieces had a solid connection. For both the barrels and the crates we have the latest instalment of Matt Experiments with Easy Ways to Paint Wood. In this case I experimented with using miniature paint on small scatter terrain like this. This turned out pretty well, and was a lot easier to achieve a nice finish compared to craft paint. I probably wouldn't use this on larger terrain, because, you know, mini paint is expensive, but for small things like furniture and crates, I kind of think it's worth it. I base coated them with GW Dryad Bark and dry brushed three GW colours, Mornfang Brown, XV88 and Gawthor Brown. The barrels, I mixed these colours in a 50-50 mix with Dryad Bark because they were turning out a little bit brighter than when I dry brushed them on the crates. The palettes I just painted the exact same way as the wood floor tiles, because I wanted these to blend in. These piles of rope and chain are something I haven't seen too much of in Scatter Terrain tutorials, though granted I haven't seen every video on YouTube, so I thought I'd throw together something for this project. They fit a dockside perfectly, and they're equally at home in dungeons just outside a barn, or just lying in an alley. To make the rope I needed something to add that dirty tan colour, as well as harden it into shape. I mixed some Mod Podge with twice as much water in a small container until it was about the consistency of whole fat milk, and mixed in brown acrylic paint until it looked like thick milky coffee. I dunked some string cut to a decent length into it, and then wrapped it into a shape that I liked to dry. The chains followed a similar pattern. I sprayed the chains with some lead belcher spray first to get a nicer, more muted metal tone. I also put a magnet facing north side up on top of some parchment paper, with another magnet underneath to keep it in place. Then it was pretty easy just to pile it into the layout that I liked on top of that parchment paper, before dripping some thin super glue over the top to seal it all up. You can do this to make different sized chain piles, I made some 1 inch big and some 2 inch big to put on top of crates and pallets respectively, as well as to put down individually. You want to be careful with thin superglue. It can have a strong exothermic reaction. Basically, it can get really hot when it dries up really quickly. If you're touching it, that can be very painful. So, like I say, do be careful with it. 
This seems to be less of a problem with gel superglue, but for this particular build, gel superglue is gonna clog up all of the chain gaps. So I would highly recommend more liquid superglue for this. Once dry, I ripped off the parchment paper and resprayed the chain and coated it in Army Painter Strong Tone Brown Wash before applying some rust effects. I took the opportunity to experiment with some AK rust colors, which I picked up a while back and never used. I figured this would be a good opportunity to see if they were worth it over the other brownie red paints, like GW Mornfrang Brown and Riser Rust and that kind of thing. I started by sponging on some dark rust with a ripped piece of sponge with most of the paint dabbed off. I then sponged medium rust over that, more lightly on top, with some lead belcher over that for variety. I actually ended up not really liking how bright this looked and went back over it with some more dark rust. It came out reasonably well, but I definitely have some more experimenting to do before I find some rust effects that I actually like. This is nothing against AK though, I think these paints are more intended as a base layer through an airbrush rather than sponged on effects. I just had them lying around and I thought I'd try them out. As the final piece of scatter terrain, I wanted some fishing nets. So I took to YouTube and the internet in general to see if any golden ideas for making fishing nets had already presented themselves. Crafting Muse, as it turns out, has a pretty sweet tutorial on making fishing nets from cheesecloth. That said, I did have some of my own ideas that I wanted to add to that technique. So I decided to include it in this video so you guys can see what I did differently and how that relates to the modular tiles because it does actually work with the modular tiles in an interesting little way. But of course, full credit for the original idea goes to her. I would never have thought of cheesecloth, despite my love of cheese. Now, one thing that I would say about her tutorial is it doesn't quite make clear that there are in fact different kinds of cheesecloth or rather different thread counts of cheesecloth. But to be entirely fair, I had no bloody clue that that was the case either until I tried to buy some. I ended up picking a cheap-ish one that was way too high a thread count to look right at the scale that we use. I ended up going back and actively looking for the cheapest, naffest stuff I could find, and then combed the reviews until I found one where people were actually complaining that the holes were too big. I have included a link in the description of the kind of cheesecloth that I ended up using. If you're in the UK, you can just use that. If you're in the US or elsewhere, um, the problem with that is I can't provide you a link and guarantee it's gonna be the right density of cheesecloth because it's kind of hard to tell from the picture. Uh, like I said, the best way I found to do that was to look at the cheesecloth online and check out the reviews and see which ones are complaining about the holes being too big. Anyway. Deep dive on cheesecloth density aside, I did change the technique a bit to fit the way I do things. Firstly, I cut the nets to the size that I wanted, in this case, two double layered five inch by four inch pieces with the folded side still attached and one smaller three inch by two inch piece and made little balls of putty all the same size, in this case, out of brown stuff to be the weights of the net. I didn't attach these yet. I waited until after the piece was made to avoid it being a sticky, annoying nightmare. My first step was to mash them into a ball and roughly handle them, which adds some nice natural looking kinks and bends to the material. Then I just dunked my cloth in the same mixture that I used for the rope, and then wrung it out and opened it up. I also blew on it to pop a lot of the bubbles that had formed between the holes. I then just lay it out in the way that I wanted on some parchment paper. I made a few different designs, one folded over and flat for the ground, one hanging over the edge of a box, again, credit to the crafting muse for this trick, and one hung on some cocktail sticks, punched into some scrap foam exactly an inch apart, which I then super glued to the net at the back when dry just to make sure that they'd stick. Though, unlike me, you probably want to paint the cocktail sticks metallic first. I forgot because my memory has as many holes as these nets. This allowed me to use them as a nautical decoration that I could add to the walls of the warehouse, which would also work well in a nautical tavern or the town hall of a fishing town. Y you get the idea. I then added my little ball weights to the edges of each piece with some super glue, gel super glue this time, aiming to keep them angled so that they look like they're hanging down. I didn't actually bother painting these because the putty I used, brown stuff, comes out with this nice dark metallic shade anyway which I thought blended in quite well with the rest of the scene and saved me a fair bit of time. I might paint these later, but they look the part well enough for now. Finally, using the same techniques I used to create the piles of chain, 
I added some small piles on top of the nets to add a little bit more messy detail and make it look like they've been tossed aside after a hard day at sea. As a bonus, these add some weight, which helps keep the pieces in place. I left the rust effects off though, because I wanted to come back when I found some that I was more happy with. The high thread count cheesecloth did actually end up coming in useful though. I experimented with wrapping it around some brown stuff to make sacks and then stained them with the same mixture I used on the nets. It came out surprisingly well for a slapdash test, and I definitely think I'll be making some in future to add to the cargo scatter. The last detail I wanted to add to this modular build was the company sign on the side of the wall. This can not only be used as a sign for a large building, but if you printed out a different design, you could also use it as a kind of fantasy billboard if you're running that kind of world in your campaign. Making it was really simple. I cut out a piece of two inch by three inch balsa wood, though you can make this size by using planks of smaller balsa to tacky glue together to build this. Or you could even use chipboard if you wanted. And then just printed out a sign that I'd made on Photoshop. I printed mine out on photo paper to capture more of the detail and then used a wide soft brush to apply some AK ultra matte varnish over the top to take away that shine completely. This particular sign and a non-setting specific variant that doesn't say the words Sword Coast can be downloaded to print by my patrons on Patreon as a thank you to them. If you're curious and would like to support the channel in making videos, the link is in the description below. Anyway, I printed this out and glued it to the balsa wood before cutting some strips of one quarter of an inch balsa, two strips three inches long and two strips one and a half inches long, which I again wire brushed first. I glued these over the edges of the sign and trimmed down the edges to add some beveling. As a final step to make the painting easier, I stained it with Army Painter Strong Tone Wash. Fast, easy, and it makes it stand out slightly from the paint scheme I've used on the walls while still blending in. The core of this build was made using a mix of the modular temple stair pieces for the docks, the wood floors and walls from a stable video, and the modular tile roof from the modular tile roof video. Finally, I added the wooden door frame and interior walls that I made in this video. Because I'd built most of the pieces in the past for other builds, this saved me a ton of building and painting for a large project and let me move straight on to adding detail. For the outside, I added the fishing nets, rusty chains and discarded ropes, as well as a few crates and barrels to add that busy, messy feeling, and added the company sign quite high near the door before slamming down the functional crane that I made last week, because it's awesome. The inside of the building was a lot busier, and you'll have some options here, which I'll mention in a minute. I placed the pallets down in the middle and piled them high with crates and barrels in a haphazard and somewhat random fashion. I find the more precise you are with this kind of thing, the weirder it looks. Throw stuff down so it just about fits. I left some crates open showing off the hair padding within and made sure to stack plenty of boxes and barrels on top of each other. I added the smaller pile of chain on one of the crates as well to add some variety. I also threw down a pallet in the corner of the entranceway along with some more discarded rope and some of the coiled rope hanging from nails that I made in the stable video, which I thought worked quite well here. I added two blocks of the stacking magnetic modular bar slash cupboard furniture as well from that video as a kind of sideboard. To spruce up the main walls, I added the hanging fishing net on one side and the company sign on the other, making the whole scene far more interesting and less monotone. Finally, I added the finishing touches scattering candles and discarded ale bottles on various crates and adding a candle, tankard and ledger book to the sideboard at the entrance. Overall, I'm very happy with how this turned out. It's a very flavorful build with a ton of reusability and modularity. Even when setting it up, you have options. If you want to have a dramatic showdown, you can have the pallets set up on the sides with the middle of the floor clear for fighting. Alternatively, you can set it up as I did originally and have the two paths circling the crates in the center, which lets you play cat and mouse, either as the party hunting their enemy or as the villains cornering the party. Either way, you can use the crates and barrels reasonably securely to place models on because they're nicely held down by the magnets. So yes, the rogue can climb and fight on the top of that cargo pile. 
Not only that, every piece is removable, so if you wanted to throw a crate down on someone, you can show that. It also allows you to have the terrain change as the party hurl things around, throwing obstacles in the path around the edge to slow down chasing enemies. I'm honestly really happy with how this build turned out. It's given me a new themed location that I can use and a ton of modular pieces that apart from the fishing nets maybe, I can use practically anywhere. And even the fishing nets, weirdly enough, adventurers seem to spend a lot of time in ports, docks, pirate towns and all that kind of stuff. So sooner or later, I'm gonna use them again. Hopefully it's also a really good example to you guys of how you can use these modular pieces to make some large builds without having to build everything from scratch every single time. Not that there's wrong anything wrong with building things from scratch, it's just when you're doing that for a large build, it can take a quite large amount of time appropriately. And this kind of, I think, stops us from investing in these large builds. Well, that and storage space. If you're not so interested in large builds, it's also really kind of good for helping you get those smaller builds done faster. And again, storage space. I'm just going to take this moment to say thank you to everybody who has supported the channel on Patreon so far. From the bottom of my heart, you guys have my deepest respect. It's only your generous support that enables small creators like me to be able to afford to keep providing this level of content this often. If you wanted to support the channel like this and you haven't already, I've got some thank yous prepared for you, like printable versions of these signs, among other printables, and also you'll get early access to all of these videos, again, among other things. As always guys, let me know what you think about this build in the comments, any ideas you have, things you'd do differently, or different ideas for terrain and accessories that would go really well with this build. And also thank you again to anyone who shares this build or any of my others with friends, or groups or anything like that. Every little helps. I really appreciate it. Finally, if you need any tools or supplies for this build or pretty much anything that I use that you're not sure where I get it, there is a link in the description to my equipment list. And if you need anything from there and you buy it through an Amazon link, it will give a small amount to the channel at no extra cost to yourself. Just a little extra way to help support the channel. Thank you guys for watching. I will be back next week. Until next time, I'll be in the archive.